Good evening. I have just come back from an international conference at Tucson in Arizona, devoted entirely to the planet Mercury. I was giving a brief paper myself, and anyway, I think this is a good time to talk about Mercury, because it's on view in the mornings this month. Mind you, it's never particularly easy to see, because it's very much closer to the sun than we are. The Earth's mean distance from the sun is 93 million miles. Mercury's ranges between 29 and 43 million, giving an average of 36 million miles. And that means it always stays in the same part of the sky, from our point of view, as the sun is. Here we see Mercury at what we call greatest elongation. And even then, the angle between Mercury and the sun is never more than 29 degrees. And that is not very far. And the result is that with the naked eye, you can only see Mercury at its best, either very low in the west after sunset, or, as this month, very low in the east before dawn. And you can never see it against a dark background. Well, I can show you the position of Mercury against the stars this month. It's not very far away from the twins, Castor and Pollux, roughly in between uh, Procyon and the sickle of Leo. But the trouble is that by the time Mercury is high enough to be seen, the sky is light, and the view you're going to get is very much more like that, and the stars will have faded out. Mind you, you can sweep for Mercury with binoculars, only whatever you do, don't do that unless the sun is completely below the horizon, otherwise you might look at the sun by mistake with disastrous results to your eyesight. But when you find Mercury, you will see that it does seem surprisingly bright. And in fact, the actual magnitude at its best is about minus 0.2, so it's then brighter than any star we can see from here, apart from Sirius. And if you could see it against a dark background, then we'd appreciate that. But to make things even more difficult for us, when Mercury is closest to us, we can't see it at all under on on ordinary conditions, because its dark side is turned towards us. Like Venus, and like the Moon, has no light of its own, and therefore it shows phases. Now here we see the orbit of Mercury, sun in the middle of course. On the 24th of July, Mercury was new, its dark side was turned towards us. Then as it moves out, it becomes a crescent. Then by August the 14th, it will be a half. Then it will turn into a three quarter shape, moving back toward the sun in our sky. And when it's full, when its bright side turned towards us, as it will be on September the 5th, then it's on the far side of the sun and clearly we can't see it at all. So Mercury is not easy to observe, but uh, in the middle of this month, I think you should find it without much difficulty. And uh, if you have a telescope, then you'll be able to see the phase. But I'm afraid not much more than that. Here's a drawing I made of Mercury some time ago with my 15-inch reflector, and frankly, it doesn't show very much. And no Earth-based telescope will show much, partly because of the difficulty of observing, Partly because Mercury never comes much within 50 million miles of us, and partly because it is small, very much smaller than the Earth. We are nearly 8,000 miles in diameter, Mercury only just over 3,000 miles in diameter, so in size it's much more lunar than terrestrial, the gravitational pull is weak, and that's why it has, to all intents and purposes, no atmosphere. And that's also why no Earth-based telescope is going to show very much on it. The first serious attempt at mapping it was made by the Italian astronomer, Schiaparelli, over a hundred years ago now. And we associate Schiaparelli, I think normally, with the non-existent canals on Mars. But he was a good observer, and he did draw a map of Mercury, and this is it. You can see their bright and dark features. And Schiaparelli always made the practice of observing Mercury when it was high up. You see, when Mercury is visible with the naked eye, it's low in the sky, not far from the horizon, the seeing's bound to be bad and you won't see much. When it's high in the sky, well, the sun's there too, but that, unfortunately, can't be helped, and that's how Schiaparelli made his observations. Now, next in the story came Percival Lowell. Now, Lowell, again associated with the non-existent canals upon Mars, founded the Flagstaff Observatory, we call it now the Lowell Observatory, way back in the 1890s, mainly to study Mars, but he also observed the planets, uh, and among those he observed Mercury, and here is Lowell's map of Mercury. 
Well, frankly, uh, it doesn't bear any relation to the truth at all. Now, you know, I have a great respect for Lowell. I never met him. He died about seven years before I was born. But he was a great benefactor of astronomy. And after all, he founded the Lowell Observatory. He was a great administrator. He was a very good mathematician. And it was his calculations which led to the tracking down of the planet Pluto, although not until after Lowell's death. He was a brilliant writer and apparently a brilliant speaker as well. So he did a great deal for astronomy. The one thing he wasn't, unfortunately, was a good observer. And he did tend to see streaky features where none existed. He saw them on Mars, Venus, Mercury, almost anywhere, everywhere. And frankly, I'm afraid so far as Mercury is concerned, and Mars for that matter, uh, we can forget his observations. That map bears no relation to the truth. But what about another astronomer who once worked at the Lowell Observatory? His name was T.J.J.C., S.W., and in 1901, using the big telescope at the United States Naval Observatory, he produced a drawing of Mercury which looked like this. And on that drawing, you can see craters. Now, we know, of course, that there are craters on Mercury. We found that out from our space probe. But uh, can they be observed from the Earth? Most people discount that drawing, and uh, frankly, I tend to do so myself. On the other hand, we've got to be very careful not to be prejudiced. And C was a very peculiar man indeed. And to say that he was unpopular with his colleagues is to put it mildly. In fact, um, I can quote what he was said about him by A.E. Dolphus, one of his erstwhile colleagues at the Lowell, Lowell Observatory. And Dolphus said, I have never felt such aversion to man or beast or anything disgusting as I have to him. I hope never to see him again, and should he ever return, I'll see he's kicked out of town. Well, he didn't return. He went to the U.S. Naval Observatory instead. We can't entirely discount that drawing, but frankly, I don't myself believe that it's possible to see craters on Mercury from the Earth with that kind of equipment anyway. And uh, I think it was a uh, largely a mixture of unconscious prejudice and uh, also a certain amount of imagination. Incidentally, uh, when Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto in, 19, uh, in 1930, uh, C wanted to name it Minerva. <laughs> and that's why uh, Minerva is called Pluto. Well, if we forget about TJJC's craters, we come on to the greatest observer, I think, of planetary detail in pre-space age times. And that was a man I knew, E.M. Antoniadi, who was a Greek by birth, but lived most of his life in France. And he drew up a map of Mercury, and you can see there some similar features to that of Schiaparelli. And uh, like Schiaparelli, Antoniadi was convinced that the rotation was of the synchronous or captured variety. And Antoniadi, remember, did have the advantage of using a very good telescope indeed, the 33-inch refractor at the observatory of Meudon near Paris. And there's a picture I took of it some time ago with Odomar Dolphus actually looking through the eyepiece. And that's a very good telescope, and I know that because in the pre-Apollo days, I myself did a great deal of moon mapping with it, and I also looked at Mercury, even though, frankly, I couldn't see very much on Mercury. Now, Antoniadi was quite sure that the rotation was captured, and that means that Mercury would keep the same face turned toward the sun all the time. Now, because Mercury is so much closer in than we are, it has a shorter year, a year of only 88 Earth days. So let's see now how Antoniadi and Schiaparelli believed Mercury to behave. Here we have the sun in the middle. There is Mercury with the day side painted white and a red marker. Now remember, Mercury takes 88 days to go around the sun. And Antoniadi imagined that it behaved like this. As it went round the sun, it turned very slowly on its axis. And as you can see, the same red marker is being directed to the sun for the entire time. And by the time Mercury has gone right round the sun, taking 88 days to do so, it's made one complete turn. So the same face is turned sunward all the time. And of course, the moon does behave that way relative to the Earth, and there's nothing mysterious about it because tidal friction is responsible. And if Mercury did behave like that, then there'd be one area of permanent day, an area of permanent night, and because Mercury's orbit is not circular, and the speed in orbit varies, there'll be a kind of very slow wobbling to and fro. And between those two extremes, there will be a kind of twilight zone where the sun would appear to rise and set. And science fiction writers made very great play of that twilight zone. I remember Isaac Asimov writing a lovely story about it involving robots. Well, that sounded all right. But in point of fact, 
it's not. In the early 1960s, infrared observations showed that the dark side of Mercury is not nearly so cold as it would be if it never had any sunlight. And we now know that the real rotation period is 58.6 days, or exactly two-thirds of a Mercurian year. And that leads to a rather strange kind of calendar. So let's have a look now and see how Mercury really does behave. Here again, sun in the middle, the day side of Mercury, and the red marker. But now, as Mercury goes round, after one-third of a rotation, our marker is here. After two-thirds of rotation, there's been one complete turn of the planet, as you can see by the red marker. And after one Mercurian year, 88 days, the red marker is now on the dark side, and it's having its night. Then one and a third year, coming back into the daylight. One and two-thirds Mercurian years. And after two Mercurian years, we are back to where we started. And so, if you're on Mercury, the interval between one sunrise and the next is 176 Earth days. But it so happens, after a rather curious relationship, which may or may not be coincidence, I don't think it is, every time we on Earth can see Mercury at its most favorably placed, then the same side is turned towards us. And uh, that may be what misled Antoniardi and Schiaparelli, assuming that the markings they saw had any basis of truth in them. But you know, it's very difficult. And the last map of Mercury produced before the flight of Mariner 10 was due to Clark Chapman. And he used the best available observations, put a computer on them, and that was what he produced. And before the flight of our one Mercury probe, Mariner 10, that was as much as we could find out about the surface features on Mercury. And frankly, it wasn't a lot. And we depend entirely upon that one spacecraft, Mariner 10, which went first of all past Venus, and then went on to make three active passes of Mercury in 1973-1974. And as soon as we started getting pictures back, then we saw that Mercury, like the Moon, is cratered. And here's a typical Mercurian view, which does look very like the Moon. There are craters, pits, ridges, mountains. There are plains also. Look at this crater with a valley coming out of it. And here's another similar view a large crater down there on the lower right-hand side. And some of the craters were seen in foreshortened view. And um, if you didn't know your lunar topography, you might easily think that that was, in fact, a view of the moon. And we have ray craters, too. That bright crater there is called Kuiper, and that's named after Gerard Kuiper, the great Dutch-American astronomer who was such a pioneer of the exploration of planet by means of space probes. But I think, you know, the most interesting feature of all is the so-called Caloris Basin. Now, here's a map that I drew myself from the Mariner observations. It only shows part of Mercury, and for all three active passes made by Mariner 10, the same part of the planet was in sunlight. And so even now, there's more than half of Mercury that's not been mapped, and frankly won't be until we have another Mercury probe. You can see the craters there in the mountains, but look there to the upper left-hand side, and here we have the great basin of Mercury, the Caloris Planitia, or the Caloris Basin. And we can only see part of it, because during the Mariner 9 passes, the other part was in shadow, and we, didn't, we still know nothing about it at all. But the Caloris Basin is a fascinating area, and there's one of the best Mariner pictures of it. Actually, as you can see, it's a mosaic made up of several views put together. And there you can see the outline of the Caloris Basin to the left-hand side, and extending over to the right, you can see the mountainous ridges and rims that are associated with it. Now, the Caloris Basin. Caloris means heat. And in fact, this is one of the very hottest parts of Mercury, and the calendar there must be very strange indeed. You remember that I said that Mercury's distance from the Sun varies between less than 30 million miles and more than 40 million, and that's quite a difference. And it so happens that when Mercury is closest to the Sun, at what we call perihelion, it's almost overhead from the Caloris Basin, hence the name Caloris, or heat. And in fact, the calendar there is strange. When the Sun rises over Caloris, it's at its smallest. As it rears the zenith or overhead point, it increases in size. And then, when it's overhead, it actually stops in the sky and then tracks backwards for about eight, eight Earth days, 
before resuming its usual movement and shrinking in size until it gets down again toward the horizon. A very strange kind of calendar indeed. But the temperature on Calaris in the middle of the long Mercurian day is over 700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's often said that Mercury is very like the moon. In ways, that's true. But there are Mercurian features we don't get on the moon. There are, for example, what we call intercrater planes, and there is one. Pits and ridges, but no large craters. Don't get those in quite the same way on the moon. And I think you might like to see also the very last picture of Mercury, which was sent back to us by Mariner 10 and its third and final active pass. By then, the instrumentation had started to fail, and although the definition is as good as ever, you only get part of the picture. Because after Mariner had made its three active passes of Mercury, it remained in orbit round the Sun, and certainly it's still going round the Sun, and still making regular close approaches to Mercury, only, of course, we've now long since lost all track of it. But, you know, we do depend entirely upon Mariner 10 for our knowledge of the Mercurian surface, and much else besides. We know much more now, for example, about the internal make-up of Mercury, which is a very dense planet, nearly as dense as the Earth, with a relatively large, iron-rich core. Again, let's have a comparison. The Earth, a large body, Mercury, a much smaller one. But the Earth's heavy, iron-rich core is much smaller, relatively, than Mercury's. And that is why Mercury is such a relatively heavy planet, and also why, unlike Mars and Venus, it does have a perceptible magnetic field. You know, this Mariner Pass happened nearly 20 years ago now, and when I was over in Tucson, we were discussing this, and in fact, there is not a great deal more we can learn, I feel, until we have a new Mercury probe. And we very much like that, the trouble is that at the moment, the NASA program is in disarray and rocket launches are very few and far between, and we've no prospect of a Mercury probe yet. One very interesting idea put forward was that of a solar sail, where in point of fact, what you have is a reflecting surface, a solar sail if you like, which works by the pressure of sunlight, and by suitable orientation of the sail, you can actually tack in toward the sun, very much as a yacht can actually move in the direction against the wind. And in that way, you don't use much power, and you can actually spiral in toward Mercury and arrive at almost middle velocity. And that, I think, may be the only way in the foreseeable future that it's going to be done, even though it won't come yet. But until we do have another Mercury probe, we're not going to learn a lot more. Just one other interesting thing. On November the 13th, there's going to be a transit of Mercury, when Mercury passes in front of the Sun's disk, and we see it as a dark speck crossing the sun, of course taking hours to do so, not quickly as you see it here. And that doesn't happen very often, but I have got here a picture of a previous transit of Mercury, and Mercury uh, is, is arrowed there, it appears smaller and darker than the sunspots, and uh, on November the 13th you will have a chance to see that, although I'm afraid not from here, it occurs at four o'clock in the morning of our time, and therefore you've got to go to another longitude, but it will be worth watching, even though it doesn't actually tell you a lot. So, what would Mercury be like seen from its surface? Well, this is Paul Doherty's impression. A black sky, a brilliant blazing sun, a total lack of atmosphere, a total lack of life. A world where nothing lives, nothing stirs, nothing's ever happened. But an interesting world, nonetheless. And so, I do suggest, if the skies are clear this month, go out, look low in the east before dawn, and there, with any luck, you will catch sight of this elusive little world so aptly named by the ancients after the messenger of the gods. Good night. And a reminder that you can see that edition of the Sky Night again on Saturday afternoon at half past three on BBC Two.